Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. My name is Harsha and I would be the moderator for today's exciting event. I would like to thank you all for taking out the time to attend the EdTech Power Hour session hosted by Harbinger. For those who are joining us for the first time, EdTech Power Hour series is the interactive series table roundtable discussion amongst industry stalwarts where they would be talking about their experiences, ideas, and insights on a particular topic. The topic for today's discussion would be digital transformation of brick and mortar universities. Before we begin, would like to play a small clip for the audience today. Ensure you have selected the right speaker for audio output. Test your speaker to ensure it is working fine from the audio settings option on the lower left corner of your screen. If necessary, dial in using phone. With that, now it's the time for the introduction. Our host for today's roundtable discussion is Ullas Pudankar. Ullas is, uh, started his career with Indian Army and now is a passionate ed tech professional with over 20 years of experience in education and training industry in India and abroad to include K-12, higher ed, and skilling segments in the education and training domain with the qualification from IIT, XLRI, and Symbiosis. We welcome you, Ullas, and over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Harsha, for that introduction. I am very glad and honored to be here uh, as a host for this Power Hour session, and especially among the distinguished panelists that we just got a glimpse of. Yes, we'll uh, go to them, but before that, uh, let me set the context. So we will be focusing on four aspects of uh, digital transformation uh, of the brick and mortar universities. Uh, first one being the need for creating a hybrid delivery model, which is sustainable and scalable. Then will digitization help in ensuring the high quality of education or will it further enhance quality of instruction? To ensure that students' retention is improved and students' outcome and student success is ensured. And the last one would be in terms of challenges that the university would face while doing this uh, transformation journey. So we will cover these four aspects and we will be questioning our panelists on uh, all of these. So let's go and meet our panelists. So we have Priyanka, Matthew, and Ahmed. So I will request them to introduce themselves and also say a few words in terms of why this topic is important to them. So ladies first, let's start with uh, Priyanka. Welcome Priyanka. Hi everyone, uh, thanks a lot for uh, the wonderful introduction and uh, warm greetings to everyone who is attending uh, this webinar today. So my name is Priyanka Nair and I'm leading the academic vertical at CPA. And uh, you know, when I, when I hear about uh, digital transformation, I think, you know, uh, it was still there, you know, it was still there two years back but then we have just realized how important or the the presence of digital transformation just you know at a at a at a different scale altogether so i come from an academic background i was a former professor working with the engineering colleges based in rajasthan so i have more than 6 years of teaching experience so you know dealing with the student community i think i have realized how important uh, this this change digitally, uh, you know, is is there the, the importance that uh, that's there, and then coming into the corporate, coming into the industry, I just realized there has been so much gap, you know, in this industry and academia. Uh, so so it's it's the right time that we can bridge it together. So there's a th th there are certain areas where the academia needs the corporates, the industry, the digital aspects, and industry needs talent. And I think, uh, you know, if these two worlds can come together with this change in place, I think that's it. I, I think we can uh, move towards a better place. Uh, the, the, the motto that uh, we really believe in, Sibia really believes in is 
digitally arming the workforce of tomorrow. I think, uh, you know, based on that, uh, I feel this topic is really, really important uh, for the industry as well as academia, the higher education space equally. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, and uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Priyanka, and uh, good to have you on the show. Let me move now to Professor Ahmed Noma. Welcome, Ahmed. Hey, thanks, Vilas. Hi, everybody. My name is Ahmed Noman, and I am currently a professor of electrical engineering at American Public University System. Prior to that, I was dean of uh, the schools of technology at several other universities, including also at APUS. And this is an important topic, obviously, which is why we are all here. And I look forward to hearing from uh, uh, Matthew and Olas and, um, and Priyanka and the rest of you during the question session. Back to you, Olas. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Ahmed. Uh, hello, welcome, Matt. How you doing, everyone? Uh, this is Matt Alex. I'm a founder of Beyond Academics. Been in uh, higher ed for about 30 years. I'm here in Miami today. Uh, been helping universities transform and reimagine their campuses. Um, I come from higher ed. I was, um, you know, I came out of college working at a university. Eventually, fell in love with what a university meant. Uh, began my consulting um, ecosystem. Built my own firm. Became a partner at Deloitte. Built Beyond. Beyond is really built on uh, reimagining the campus. I, I, for about 20 years, I redesigned uh, universities from Ivy's to the community colleges to really, you know, manage the back end of a system. I recognized when I was at Deloitte that I had to transform a campus beyond just the technology and the back office. I had to transform the education. I had to uh, transform the experience. I had to transform the efficiency. And so I am built on really about transformation and the things that we have to do to, you know, provide the next generation of, of uh, experiences and outcomes that we really need higher ed to, to uh, navigate on. I'm excited to be out here for the conversation and uh, look forward to it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Matt. I think it's wonderful getting introduced to the three of you. Uh, we definitely have a great uh, panel today, and I think we have uh, coverage from uh, university, from academia, from technology, and of course we have beyond academics and beyond technology. So before we go to question answer, let me let me initiate a poll. So I think uh, we just want to do a quick poll to get the uh, get a feel from the audience. So, uh, Harsha, are you ready with the poll? Let me just read this out. What would be the three most important components from for building a hybrid learning model for higher ed? And uh, there are multiple options. You need to choose only three of them. And uh, these options are uh, existing content revision, micro learning, redesigning class classroom experience, accessibility, virtual labs, gamification, new learning platform, new technology, or micro credentialing. So multiple options, choose three. And uh, can we have the poll, uh, Arsha? Yeah, so there we go. And yes, you can start off. It's been about 20, 30 seconds so that uh, everybody can contribute. And while all these options may be important, I think it would depend on what stage of digital transformation you are at to you know, look at what is important to you. I hope you can see the uh, responses from the audience. Yes. So this says maximum percentage have uh, opted for revising existing content for new modalities. So can be a good point where, and people are also talking about some other uh, options as well into the chat. We'll look at that. We'll stop sharing so that you guys can continue. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, one second. There is, uh, yeah, so surprisingly, there is 43% for revising existing content and the same percentage for redesigning of the classroom experience and the same percentage for accessibility and the same percentage for micro credentials. Yeah, so that's very interesting. So 
So we have four or five, uh, you know, top of the line uh, features that I think the audience would like to focus on. So that's interesting, and uh, we will cover most of them uh, in the, you know, during the discussion. So let me stop this and thank you very much, audience, for your participation. Yes. So <clears throat> what we would do is before uh, going to the questions uh, for the panelists, let me just set the context. And uh, let me start with, uh, let me use uh, this uh, thing called future of education. Everybody's talking about that. Yeah? We'll all agree that uh, future of education would be a derivative of future of work. And future of work will define what is the future of skills. Now, therefore, education, future of education needs to align itself with, uh, you know, what are the future of skills required. And I think there is no uh, doubt in terms of the fact that, you know, uh, education has to lead to employment. So let's look at the last pillar. So this is why, why education, yeah? So education for employment, obviously, but some of the things that are going to happen now is that skills will have more priority over degrees. Micro-credentialing will become important, which also came up during the poll. So if a learner attends only a particular subject in a semester, he or she would still get the credits for it and will not really have to do the entire semester in the entire course. So there will be these small uh, modules that one could do and add to their uh, skill set. And uh, yes, I mean, uh, education will not end with work and employment, but it's lifelong and uh, continuous learning. So that is the why for future of education. Now let's come to how, which is the middle pillar. So it's about content being more engaging and more uh, interesting and more interactive. So there is, you know, a curriculum redesign that is called for. So the very first point is driven by future of skills. So there is a recent report from McKenzie, which, uh, which outlines the future of skills. They've actually listed 56 different skills. Uh, in that report, and these are under uh, four distinct heads. And uh, these heads, uh, I think, are cognitive uh, skills. Uh, then we have self-leadership skills, interpersonal skills, social skills, and digital skills. So under these four headings, there are 56 skills listed. So I would request, uh, uh, Harsha, if you can share the link in the chat so that uh, you know, the audience can uh, take a closer look at future of skills. Yeah, so surely the, the curriculum and the content needs to be designed, keeping in mind future of skills. It needs to be affordable and accessible. Accessible here refers to, uh, uh, you know, accessible across devices. Uh, Hyper-personalized and adaptive learning, surely. And uh, use of, uh, you know, some very interesting frameworks. So these frameworks could be technology frameworks, or these could be competency-driven frameworks. So that would comprise in terms of, of course, these are not limiting. There could be many more thoughts that we could uh, hear from the panelists today. So curriculum design is how it's going to happen. If we go to the first pillar, this would answer the what, why, what, where, and when of uh, future of education. So here we are talking about a hybrid instructional delivery model. So it has to cater to obviously the participants. These could be traditional students or non-traditional students. This would include the faculty and the administrators. There would be redesigning of classroom. It has to cater to online as well as offline students. The focus has to be on objectives, should be on objectives. The objectives could be obviously in terms of student performance, or it could be even in terms of saving up uh, time for the faculty. So depending on the defined objectives, the model could take shape. And uh, yes, most importantly, leveraging technology. So the hybrid model could leverage uh, AI, AR, VR, and uh, you know, create a model that best suits uh, the objective set by the uh, institution. So with that as a background for today, let me just straight away go on to the questions. So the first question goes out to both Matt and Emma. What are your thoughts? and advice on what should be an effective hybrid education model. So let's go with Matt first. Well, it's a pretty big question. So the way I look at hybrid model is that you got to understand what you're teaching. So I, I look at things in two, two forms, either it's structured or unstructured. And what that means is structured learning is things that are 
sequential, rule-based, uh, one-way direction. It's very structured kind of data. It, it can be taught anywhere. It can be taught in a, um, in a synchronous model as well as a asynchronous model. That is very structured. Then there is what we call unstructured learning, meaning it requires critical thinking, critical reasoning, uh, empathy, body language. In order for us at universities, we have to start to delegate, what are we teaching? Then that is when we start to say, what can be hybrid? What needs to be in a classroom? What needs to be when you're with people? And then what needs to be done outside of a classroom? Traditionally, we, we, we do lectures and it's very much a, a structured discussion. You don't need someone to sit in a classroom for 45 minutes. You should be able to have that person have that content anywhere on demand at any point in time. Those are the things that become a more structured learning at, at the time when it's necessary. But then the, the things that are needed and the way that we interact, even with we learn, even in my consulting group, it is about us communicating, about us forming uh, thoughts and being challenged as opposed to one person sitting on the stage talking to us for 45 minutes, it's not the best way. Hybrid learning is about understanding structured and unstructured learning, the content, putting it in, in that form. That's when you start using AI and machine learning. That's when you start using the platforms that allow for that structured data because computers can do that. Videos can do that. But the unstructured requires humans. It requires amazing uh, teachers to come in and be able to take you to the journey of learning. That is the, the unstructured element of it. And that's how I look at hybrid learning. And that's when I talk to schools is what is needs to be on, in the classroom? What needs to be done remotely? When can it be done? And, and the last, you talked about future of education. When we think about future of work, the, the, the question we have to ask is what, is, what, do, what do you do? What do you teach? How do you teach it? Where do you teach it? Where, why you teach it? The why is the most important piece because in the why you answer the question, is it for earning it or is it for learning it? We live in a very much earn it model today, right? We, we make people take quizzes to, to determine if they've earned something, earned a grade. We have to move to a learn it model. That's why the competency element comes into play. That's when schools start to become really powerful because we start to say, what has this person learned? When we start to use that in the hybrid model, and start to, to say what competency is, then it becomes a more on-demand model, and that's how you take a hybrid to the next level. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Matt, for sharing that. And yeah, I understand, you know, one is the structured part, and the other is to need to structure the unstructured as well, you know, and the distinction between, you know, earning and learning. So thank you for that. And uh, I, uh, Ahmed, would you like to go next on the same question? Sure. Um, so I agree with, uh, with uh, what Matthew uh, Alex said uh, a little while ago. Um, the thing is, these days, he, he talked about both the online portion and the um, in-class portion. But the, the thing is that both for education and for work, there are some people, if you're delivering education widely, who can only access the material online. They don't have the opportunity or the time to go to an in-class uh, uh, kind of presentation. So what Matt talked about is one has to build on that and say, okay, if, if for some reason a large number of people cannot attend an in-person class, that is the same physical classroom, can we have synchronous delivery of uh, you know, lectures or uh, questions and answers um, in an online modality? Right? So that's one particular piece. And then the, the, this uh, earn it, learn it distinction is, uh, is, <laughs> is interesting. Um, the, my thought about that is it is not so much, so I, I put myself in the role of an employer. So the, for me, the bottom line is not what have you learned, but what can you do for me? Right. So demonstrating their learning via uh, some projects and so forth becomes important for the students because the assessment of learning right, and the assessment of the capability of what can be done is really important. In fact, the uh, um, uh, ABET, which is the, uh, an accreditation body for engineering and technology, defines outcomes are what students know and are able to do by the time they graduate. Right. So We've talked about education, but I would, uh, and, and primarily in the context of what appears to me to be instruction delivery 
and, and content-based learning, but assessment is a very important component. So while I agree with some of the remarks in the chat and what Matt was saying is, you know, maybe grades are not so useful. The point still is you have to determine how much has a student learned and can they apply it, right? So at some level or the other assessment comes in because the vast majority of employers are not going to do their own testing on the, on the applicants. So somebody, typically a university or college or some other uh, organization, basically goes through that testing or assessment process and says, yeah, we, we, we stand up and say that this person or this individual who is graduating with this credential actually knows this, the, the topical area and is able to apply it to solve problems in the real world. So that piece becomes important as well in the context of um, this hybridization that you were talking about, both Ulhas, you and Matt. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Ahmed, for these thoughts. Yeah, so we understand as you know, the, the assessment needs to be more in terms of assessing the application of learning, not just the qualification. We spoke about you know, skills versus degrees. The other point you also brought about was about accessibility. And I think that is important in terms of the reach of uh, education and how technology can you know, help there. So thank you for that. And uh, let's move on to, one second. Yeah, let's move on to Priyanka. Priyanka, the question for you is, uh, can you share your own efforts in redesigning the courses and curriculum at CBR? I think we'll ask, uh, the, the points that uh, were put by Alex and Ahmed, I think uh, we are pretty much in sync with that. You know, we have to realize that, you know, there is a structured and unstructured elements to education. You know, that, that there's a hybrid flavor to it. Now, when, I, when we look at the traditional curriculum or the content, you know, it's mostly like what you are studying, you know, how things has to be implemented. You learn a technology, you learn a concept, uh, you know, like Ahmed said, it's just, you know, you take an assessment and that's that's done. But then at the end, we have uh, personally realized that at the end of somebody learning, the outcome, what is the outcome, you know? Where is it? So the, the students, the learner community is only focusing on what they have learned, what is the syntax of a particular technology, you know, what they have, what is the concept, what is the definition, but then you have to realize that the technology can be applied in which space, what is the problem statement that can be addressed by a particular technology, so they need to have that understanding, what is the problem, and for that particular problem, what kind of technology and what kind of concepts, which part of the technology concepts can be applied. So what we call as W5H principles, right? So we are just catering, the traditional curriculum is just catering to one H, that is how something is to be done. But then why we are doing it, why we are, so technology is a device to solve something. That problem solving inclination has to be there. So at Zibio, we, we really believe in making an experiential learning journey for the students. And the curriculum is stitched in a manner that they have theoretical, practical knowledge about the technology. Plus they're working extensively on the projects where they are following up a life cycle of the, you know, a software development, a software development life cycle that we say. There, they the, the first thing that they should understand is what is a requirement of the end user? What is the kind of product that they want to uh, develop? So that first step, uh, so normally, you know, what I have realized when working with the learner community, they just say, I have to implement this. This is my code and that's done. My output is here, but then, uh, you know, that's just one part. Implementation is just one part. Why are we implementing that? Which is the application space? Are you trying to solve a problem in, uh, in education? Are you trying to solve a problem in the banking sector? So that understanding if they get, I think uh, the, the, the problem is solved. So the curriculum is really following that hybrid approach, the structured and the unstructured, wherein I can refer to the content I can learn the theory, the concepts in a self in the self mode, you know, a self learning phase. But then, where I need a mentorship, there is some practical hands on, a project learning approach. I think the mentors can come in and handhold the students and say that, you know, this is my experience and 
uh, this technology can be applied to a particular sector in such a manner. So the, the curriculum that we follow or we envision in the future also, that's, that's more of a, a blend of the self-learning, e-learning, videos, maybe metaverse someday. So that's the, that's the era, metaverse, it could be a solution. Uh, so that's that's the future of curriculum that we are looking up, looking at. It's it's not uh, some content anymore or just a course anymore where you're learning five technological aspects. You have to understand where each of those aspects can be applied, which problem statement can be addressed. I think that's very important. If they understand the life cycle. I think uh, the major solution, the the skill gap that we say today, the, the gap that is there in the skill, uh, so that can be really addressed. We need not train the students really, you know, when they when they come, when they graduate, when they come out of our course, we really do not need that separate training. Why not train, train them since the beginning? Let's train for each concept that they're learning right from the problem statement. This is the problem statement look how this technology can solve a purpose. I think that's something that we really uh, are doing and we really envision to do in future also with that thought process. Thank you, Priyanka. Good to hear all that. Yes, you mentioned about holistic learning at the same time, you know, practical aspect in terms of what problems are you solving. You also mentioned, you know, 5WH in terms of, uh, you know, choosing what technology to use to, what, to solve what problems. So that actually brings me to my next uh, one second. Yeah, the next slide, which talks about drivers for digitization in higher education schools. So let's look at what are these drivers. So you know, so like you said, problem. Yeah. So there is a problem of faculty spending more than you know uh, maybe equal to fifty percent of their time and in, in non-teaching work. You know, there's no contact with the student. Faculty is overburdened with a lot of administrative and routine work. So how can, uh, this definitely is a good driver for technology. So how can technology help there? Then we obviously look at, uh, you know, enhanced uh, learning outcomes, which is uh, you know, so how technology can help there. I think there is one uh, case study available, which is very popular, which is of Georgia Tech University, you know, where they have uh, deployed technology and have actually shown improvement in uh, student registration, students' uh, attendance, and students' performance. So that's a great case. And this definitely is a case for, uh, you know, how we could use uh, digital transformation for enhancing the outcomes. Uh, equity, I think Amaz also talked about it, that, uh, you know, education needs to reach uh, far and wide and cover the underprivileged. And uh, lastly, yes, the biggest driver for education is uh, you know, learning and earning, you know, let me put it that way. <laughs> so it's, you know, employment uh, with respect to uh, whatever an individual considers an employment, gainful, meaningful employment. Yeah, so these are uh, some of the drivers that we can uh, look at in terms of deploying technology. And uh, with that, let us go to some of the core problems that we talked about uh, in the beginning. So, so I have a uh, question for you. So, how do you think uh, digital transformation could help in uh, in you know freeing up uh, faculty time, supporting educators? Yeah, you uh, talked about that, Ulas, and and actually Matt and uh, Priyanka also talked about it. The value from an instructor comes in when they actually interact with the with a student and can guide them, right? So all the other work, including content delivery, is basically. Uh, uh, not getting at the heart of the interaction between the student and the teacher. Content can be delivered in a variety of ways, right? Including you know, self-paced learning and so on and so forth. But when a student is, for instance, some concept is being delivered and they're not able to understand it in a particular way, in the way it is delivered, then they should be able to reach out and ask somebody, hey, I'm not getting this. Can you explain it to me in a different way? That kind of interaction between a student and an instructor is very important. Being able to answer a student's question in multiple ways so that the students can learn. And, and, and beyond that too, there's the aspect of mentorship that comes in because in, in, in the kind of conversations that we have in person, often you know, a student will come in to ask about something and then they'll begin, you know, the conversation will move on to, well, what kind of uh, uh, jobs and careers are out there in industry? 
uh, what sort of things um, can one do with the material that I am learning? And it, so it becomes a, as to, I like that distinction that Matt made in structured and unstructured learning, right? So those kinds of conversations become very important in terms of the interaction between the students and the instructors. So, so from my perspective, if you can deliver the content and to a certain extent deliver the assessment without the involvement of a, of a, a faculty member, uh, and this has to be done with in academic integrity to make sure that it is the, the academic in integrity of the process is uh, maintained. Um, that kind of work can and should be um, digitized. But the in-person interaction actually with, with these days with the past two years of the pandemic and in any case, the, the, the technology evolving, um, the, the interaction, this kind of video interaction that we are having now is still um, is valuable, so it doesn't really have to be in the same physical space. Now, some of the you know the the, the uh, nonverbal communications, gestures, and so forth, and uh, can may or may not come through, right? But to some extent, they do. And and so, for, from my perspective, the biggest uh, value that can come from digitization or uh, 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 distributed delivery and digitization of the education is if it can increase the component or the length uh, duration of times that uh, a faculty member is able to spend with individual students and maybe sometimes in a group session because because the group learning also occurs you know when there are multiple people like we are here uh, several people talking together and basically one idea leads to another and they kind of bounce off each other and, and, and engage so Promoting that interaction between the faculty and, and, and uh, students, either on a one-to-one -one basis or a one-to-many basis, or maybe a many-to-many -many basis, because I've often felt that maybe having two instructors teaching the, you know, they can stand in front of the, I'm using this as the old style example, or you can use it in the new style example, whereby one instructor delivers some material and the other one says, hmm, okay, can you, to, to basically sometimes students are reluctant to ask questions, right? To see that process or to genuinely agree that, uh, you know, Hey, the, appro the approach that you used isn't, I'm not quite getting it. Uh, can you explain it a different way? Or look, here's an alternate perspective. So if that kind of interaction between students and instru instructors can be promoted, that is to say, faculty time is freed up to engage in this kind of behavior, right? Rather than the more, uh, you know, uh, uh, rote or routine work, uh, that would be the, uh, uh, a valuable thing to have happened. Back to you, Alas. Yeah, great. Thanks so much uh, for that input, uh, Ahmed. And yeah, there is no replacement to personal interaction, but the way the technology is catching up, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> metaverse and what have you. So yes, video is already there. So there is the possibility of using technology to a great extent in terms of minimizing, uh, you know, uh, the faculty time on, in routine jobs and, you know, enhancing more of interaction and, and, and teaching. So thanks for uh, those inputs. Let me move on to, to Matt and uh, ask him how can digital transformation help in enhancing outcomes? So, you know, the way I look at outcomes, you have to look at, you know, who are you serving? In a traditional higher ed model, even today, we are navigating in what I would call an institution centric model. So everything we do at a campus right now is institution centric. You have policies, procedures, your structure, your all the politics, all institution centric. So when you design a university on outcomes, you're designing it to an institution centric model. The future is actually a student centric model. It is the outcome of that student. So when we think about the outcome of a student centric model, and remember, there are different type of students. There's first generation, there's, you know, all different types of student bodies that need different type of learning. I'm, we have different learning chemistries. I learn and absorb information differently. You have to think about that outcome. And that when we think about experiences, the only thing we have to now start to do is recognize what our students, our learners, even us as even older, what are our experiences around Amazon or Uber or movies or iTunes? Just think about those things. Those things are personalized, they're responsive, they're intuitive, they're, um, they are transparent, they are unbundled, and they are 
allowing you comfort in what you do in that ecosystem. So higher ed has to build a ecosystem around that same model. If you think about our students and the ones that will be coming in the future, they're all gamers. They all come from a, a virtual ecosystem that is comfortable with navigating this kind of conversation. You know, in my days, I need human interaction. My son doesn't need as much human interaction. His ability to go to school is gonna be different when he gets into college in four years. Universities have to build the experience based on who that is, what the learning experience is, what the learning chemistries are, and then decide what smart retail is doing, smart, um, smart venues, smart banking. Look at all the smart ecosystems, take the use cases of it, apply it to students, because students are consumers, they're customers, and they're products. If you look at them that way, you will design a university with outcomes that are meeting the needs of those students more than the institution of, of a grade or an institution of a lecturer or an institution of a 120 hour degree. That is when we start to really imagine and reimagine the outcomes of the campuses that we are gonna design for the future. Absolutely, Matt, thank you so much for sharing that. And I think there is no doubt that, uh, you know, uh, the future of learning needs to be student-centered and not, uh, you know, any of the other things. And uh, given the fact that uh, learners learn in different ways, I think personalized and adaptive learning uh, you know, would definitely help in, uh, you know, meeting outcomes. Yeah, so thanks for that. And uh, let me go to Priyanka and, uh, yeah, Priyanka. So can you help us in uh, so, understanding your yeah, digital transformation? Yeah, go ahead. So I think uh, a lot of aspects of uh, digital learning when we talk about, you know, there are uh, three, four pillars that we can, you know, think of. Uh, one is uh, the technology, of course, and there are people involved in that, right? So there are the, there is people, there are processes, and there are, uh, you know, there's a technology. So uh, when, when we go to the universities, you know, uh, these days there's a reluctance in, you know, adapt, you know accepting uh, that change you know, when, when you when you challenge that traditional model, you know, in you know, th there is a reluctance, uh, you know, in that space that, that that has been the realization. So when we go to the university, like Matt said that, you know, we have to tell them that the experiences, every student has a different learning journey, how I learn is quite different to some, you know, how somebody else learns. So uh, so there are different types of approaches that we, you know, provide to the universities, you know, like I said, you know, there are students who would prefer just, you know, learning at their own pace. So, you know, if I give them some, you know, material, they can, they can learn on their own space. And when they come to that practical implementation, they would need some, you know, mentorship. So, so that, that's one kind of model. Then there is where they would require a live instructor, you know, model where they are learning with the instructor continuously so that that's another approach so so we are not mandating somebody to select one approach and follow it so there is a, a bundle that we are providing like matt said that you you need to provide that to the students right so so for me something works some something doesn't work so i should have that uh, liberty that flexibility to pick and build my own learning roadmap so I think for the universities, when we when we go to the universities, these technologies, these specializations are provided in a personalized journey. Every student have their own personalized journey, I would say. So in that manner, we are uh, providing. So one more thing, uh, you know, uh, I would like to add here. So when Ahmed said that assessments, these assessments are really important. So uh, the universities have their own traditional model of just with the sake of grading. You know, they, they are just intending somebody, you know, passes these 10 questions and that's that's their definition of somebody uh, somebody's success or somebody's, you know, uh, or failure. So I think uh, that has to really change. So at our organization at Zebia, we really feel that continuous evaluation is something that we really follow here. So along with the concepts, the learning journey somebody is having, that continuous evaluation is a part of the entire process. 
uh, not just to tell somebody that uh, you know uh, you are failing you are scoring good you are scoring not so good but then at every stage i know myself my growth or you know at this at you know out of these 10 things i'm really good uh, good in these uh, eight things i can be better these are the two areas where i'm not really good at maybe i can you know be better at it or maybe i can focus on those eight things so it could be any kind of analysis that can happen with, uh, with that continuous evaluation so with with all these online learning platforms the self learning models the e learning videos live instructions uh, that are happening mentorship hybrid blended you know the the modes that are already there the the major element that we find is the evaluation and a continuous evaluation model that is not just from the from the perspective of grading somebody but yes it's from the perspective of somebody learning you know the, the outcome has to be learning not just grading that that makes no sense really you know when they come out so that that's something yeah. that we are contributing to yeah, you know, on, on one of the things i i, I want to make sure we understand when we think about assessment if we just do it from a a learning uh, assessment, if we do, do it from just a course, it's very, what I would say, institution centric. What we have to do, we have to understand we are in a, what we call a educational value chain. There's individuals, which are learners, there's industries, which is companies, and there's institutions, universities, right? If we think about the value chain, the assessment shouldn't be just from the path of that course. It should be the path of that industry to say this student has come here, has taken these courses in their in their credentials, you know, blockchain or whatever we, we track. And then it needs to come back into the value chain to say when this student takes these type of courses, they do really well in our corporation. That needs to feed back into the university. It needs to be feed back into that instant that in, individual to recognize what are the type of courses that's going to excel them into the future. Because if you think about future work, the jobs of the future doesn't exist today. So we have to be continuously learning. So individuals should be continuous learning. They should be assessed based on the HR of how other people are doing and then bringing it back. If we just sit here and uh, assess how a classroom is teaching somebody based on a grade, we're only doing it from an institution centric and we have to move it from a student centric and an industry centric and educational value centric. That's when we really become powerful. We build a reputation economy, just like Uber and everything else is doing for us today. Absolutely, Matt. Uh, very well said. And I think right at the outset, we mentioned that, you know, uh, future of education needs to align with future of work. And absolutely, uh, you know, there are no two ways on that. And uh, Priyanka, thanks for sharing your thoughts in terms of, you know, making personalized uh, uh, learning more, uh, uh, you know, drive more towards that. Uh, so I had a question for you, Priyanka, is that, um, you know, at Zebia, uh, you know, you're working with a lot of uh, universities and you're kind of helping them reach out to a larger market. So what are some of the maybe one or two technology challenges that you see? Sorry, can, can you please repeat that? I'm what sorry. are some of the technology, one or two technology challenges okay. that you face in helping these universities, uh, you know, uh, reach out to larger audiences? Uh, the technologies that we are majorly focusing on is AI and cloud, you know, so that, that's really making a difference to these universities. It's So there are other uh, technologies also like, you know, full stack, uh, cyber security or big data, data engineering. I think uh, the major contributors, uh, you know, the major buzz around is the AI, cloud, full stack. So th these are, you know, some of the technologies that are really uh, making a difference to the universities, you know, to the community. I think um, majorly because they can see some, you know, uh, examples running around them, you know. So so when they they, they think of AI, they can witness those examples, you know, around them. So they can see the AI being implemented in education. So the virtual spaces, cloud, if I say. So, you know, there are so many, you know, if I, the simplest is one, right? So, you know, you can, you can store everything on the cloud. So, so they can relate really well with these technologies and these technologies are being incorporated in the education sector as well. Uh, with a lot of witnessing that is happening. So I think uh, those are uh, two, three technologies that I would uh, you know, say. Great, thank you so much Priyanka for sharing that. I was, uh, yeah, so thank you everybody. I was just driving uh, the discussion to a point where uh, 
you know most universities have a huge amount of content you know for different curriculums for different streams and you know uh, so many courses so you know they have made that investment it becomes difficult to modernize that content to keep in you know aligned with the new technologies and uh, new features that need to be built so i just wanted to share what we call as expert framework this is a framework built by harbinger to help uh, universities uh, you know modernize large uh, amount of uh, course content and we call it x smart and x is the center portion which is the automation which is uh, the most important part of it in terms of identifying uh what could be the reusable elements in the existing content in terms of you know videos images um actual uh, actual content in terms of uh, the text so in terms of uh, automation it's important to identify what is it that could be reused what is it that could be templatized so that uh, uh, so that the university will uh, you know be able to get a solution much faster and uh, more efficiently without uh, you know wasting the earlier efforts and uh, you know so there are a lot of other uh, areas in which you know automation can be identified depending on specific universities and the smart uh, let me just quickly go through that uh, so the first part is searchable so there should be ease of searching the content in terms of uh, you know learning objectives or uh, you know keywords that we achieve through you know, metadata content tagging uh learning now is desired in uh, bytes and uh, you know for uh, the same work allows the creation of micro lessons accessibility for uh, section 508 or uh, vcag uh, 2.1 aaa uh, is also something that the framework can uh, you know quickly enable the instructional design takes into account uh, the responsiveness uh, across devices and uh, there is trackability beyond uh, scom Uh, whether it is uh, SAPI or LRS, so this entire framework uh, ensures protection of the existing investment and uh, allows universities to quickly do modernization in the at a lower cost and uh, you know uh, very very speedily. So I thought I'll sh just share this because when we are talking about digital transformation for the brick and mortar industry, I think one of the big questions that they have is you know. we have so much of content you know if you're going to tell us to <laughs> modernize everything in in the top class order then you know we going to really uh, dig deep down in our pockets so yeah there are these frameworks which can help in uh, you know minimizing and optimizing the the effort okay so with that let's go back to our uh, some of the core questions that we spoke about uh, in the beginning so let's start with matt Uh, Matt, how is uh, what role digital transformation is going to play in uh, improving student retention? Because there are, you know, some universities complaining in terms of uh, dropout rates increasing. So, what are your views on this? Yeah. So, when we look at numbers, I mean, universities are run based on enrollment numbers, and enrollment numbers is just the tail light to tell you if you're doing something right or wrong. Yeah, everyone thinks they're going to resolve the enrollment number by applying technology to figure out how to get more students in a classroom. It, it, you're you're trying to apply, you know, things in the after the fact, right? The reality of it is, you have to re you have to reimagine what you do. I look at it in three P's, right? You have to personalize that education for whoever you're serving. They have to feel personalized in the path. to be retained or even to have enrollment that's the first thing so you have offerings have to be personalized to the outcome of that person you need to be persistent meaning consistent relationship with that student throughout their the terms of that piece that's a second p the third is the pathways the pathway has to lead to value for that person so in order to keep them persistent and even have bring continuous enrollment you have to be personalized you have to be persistent and you have to have pathways If you just start looking at enrollment numbers and looking at a technology and how do I get more, you know, a CRM or cuz to be honest with you everyone goes at a at the res, the the solution as a technology and it's the wrong thing to do. You have to have strategy, you have to have strategy around personal uh, personalization, persistence and pathways. If you have strategy which requires humans, it doesn't require technology. It requires humans to rethink what they're offering 
and it will drive much more retention than just applying some sort of technology, some sort of AI, some sort of nudging. You know, those are all great, but you better have a strategy before you do any of those things. And that's one thing I always guide my clients is let's look at the, the things that you're doing in a strategic lens, then apply the technology to that. Absolutely, Matt. I think uh, we couldn't agree more. One, of course, is uh, the, the good uh, point about the three Ps. And uh, the other one in terms of, uh, uh, you know, technology ha is an enabler. And we understand that unless until you have a strategic view in terms of what is the objective, okay, and then, then you can have the right choice of technology. So technology is always available. Yeah, that's true. So let's move on to... Another question. This one is for Priyanka. Yeah. So Priyanka, how? Uh, what are your thoughts on how digital transformation can help in terms of, you know, uh, quality of instruction? I think the last, uh, you know, the, this technology has eased out a lot of aspects of education. So, you know, like Matt said in the uh, in the beginning, you know, it's not really required that, you know, 45 minutes have to be spent in class, you know, uh, regularly. So if some parts of it can be automated, I think that uh, that output can also be, you know, uh, be enhanced. So if I if I speak about, you know, uh, the assessments, if there can be some automated assessments, I'll get the scores, you know, I, I, I do not need any, uh, you know, uh, faculty to be there checking each question and, you know, spending so much of time that time can be utilized somewhere else that, uh, you know, the, the results that has been automated, I think the faculty can use that time to to guide the students, you know, where they can improve or how they can improve or, or whatever the uh, the math is. Uh, but then uh, I, I feel that uh, a lot of aspects of digital uh, inclination has, uh, in, you know, improved the quality of uh, instruction, you know, uh, in, in the in the live spaces. So one is definitely the assessments that are, you know, automated. The online platforms with gamifications and those spaces, uh, the practice ground the students are getting, you know, the, the, the concepts are being taught and they have that virtual space where they can, you know, just hit and trial and get the output in an automated system. There are test cases, they can run it, trial, hit and trial it. So there is a practice ground that is available. So we have a lot of online platforms that provide these spaces to the students the personalized journey, like like I said, uh, uh, in a class of like 60 or, you know, 80 students, I cannot focus on individual student. So for that, if I can, you know, have that personalized journey for the, for the, for this, for the learner community, I think a lot of aspects of that teaching or that pedagogy has already been improved. So, so the automation has really made it easier to bring an effective outcome where it's not just the learner community who is being equipped, but the faculties also, they can dedicate their time in a, in a more better manner. They can contribute to the education space in a more productive manner. So I think, uh, you know, the, the automation has really made it really easier. And the, the realization has really happened in the past two years, you know, when the, the world had to, uh, you know, uh, be uh, using this you know space so it was so difficult in the in the beginning especially you know here you know for us where we are completely traditional uh, so uh, so you know going digital was initially a bit difficult but then once that happened uh, a lot of things became easier as a, as a faculty i think you know it it, it my my life became easier my productivity was uh, increasing and the outcome the students uh, uh, you know, performance had really increased because uh, in an automated system, it was a quick assessment that they could take and they can come back to me and say that, you know, these are the five areas I couldn't really score. Can you, you know, help me out here? These are the five things I'm really okay. So I think those are the aspects uh, I feel that the digital trans, uh, the, the change has really brought to this space. Thank you, Priyanka, for that. And uh, let's quickly move on. I'm just doing a time check. We have uh, 10 minutes. So I have a uh, question for you in terms of uh, impact on student outcomes and success. Yeah, I, I mean, if you're talking about both in terms of technology and the forced switch to, uh, uh, to certain technologies because of the pandemic that has affected student outcomes. Um, 
maybe it's just a hiccup. It, by when I say affected, it means that some of the student outcomes may have been weakened, uh, uh, but others may have been strengthened. So it's it, it's not uh, there's no single answer that I can provide uh, for this. Uh, but it does uh, occur to me a couple of other things that I, I noted as we were having a conversation earlier is maybe in some of these uh, talks like this and so forth, it'd be good to have uh, representatives of students and employers because mm -hmm. education is in that sense a very weird system, right? We educate students, but ultimately they are hired by someone else. So it, it's it's not, you know, who's... who's uh, uh, um, uh, requirements are we satisfying, right? And maybe, and then there's a third entity which doesn't speak at all in these, and I've not heard of, which is society itself, which goes to the purpose of education. Why are we educating these people? Is it just to make worker bees, drones who will go and do their technology stuff or whatever it is? Uh, or or the, 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 who can think more holistically about the world that they live in? I can, for instance, to just give you an example, you, I can see a lot of people working on just the technologies and all the just the industry solutions. And meanwhile, the climate is going all to hell as you can experience right where you are living right now, right? And, and so it's that, that sense also needs to be brought in. So when we have, if we fragment the education process too much, okay, by making everything too micro uh, and not allowing that chance for integration of the knowledge and skills that people, uh, that students have learned to come together and deal with realistic issues, which may not be functional issues for a particular company or whoever they're working for, but they are for the larger society. I mean, that has to be incorporated as well. So that was one point and uh, two of the points. And um, the other thing I worry a little bit about technology is that it, it, it widens the equity gap. Okay, I, I teach students online and there's, there's some, and these are adults, right? Um, some of them are young, some of them in, in their 20s, uh, early 20s, and some are older, but age doesn't really matter in that sense because many of them are not tech savvy. They, they, they don't understand it. And the other piece that comes in is, if you're really trying to deliver education to a broad set of students, then, and it becomes very technology heavy, Right in terms of where the student has to have a device or access to a communications, high bandwidth communications, right? So then we basically widen the gap between the haves and the have nots. So in the bigger process, we have to address these things as well. And then finally, I'll just say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Alas, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question directly, but I think these are the points that are important. We, we sort of alluded to several people did, uh, you know, Matt and, 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 and Priyanka and so forth. The student life cycle, that means that, you know, right from the time when you attract an application, you know, what are you presenting? And what are you delivering? So, and that will attract certain kinds of students. Then supporting those students, through the process. And sometimes um, it's not just the academics. Uh, and I like Matt's use of the word, you know, the ecosystem where sometimes students get stuck because they may just be a few hundred dollars short in paying for their last three credits for a course. And so now their degree is held up, right? Uh, we, we, one can ar argue in other ways, well, maybe that shouldn't happen. But the reason we use degrees and so forth is they're markers of capability, right, and more, more or less. But the point that I'm making is in, uh, with mental health challenges these days, uh, with financial challenges and so forth. So if you really want to address the student issue of you know, retention and enrollment and enable them to learn, those other things come in. Now, they're not primarily the, the responsibility of a university or educational institution, but like being in the ecosystem, if you ignore that portion of the system, you can't get the outcomes in terms of student learning or achievement or skills that you're looking for. So I'll, I'll stop there because we could- well, Absolutely, I mean, I think uh, very, very valuable points made and I would just quickly uh, highlight the one that was very important is in terms of involving the stakeholders, you know, and creating that entire ecosystem rather than looking at it in isolation. So that is excellent. Uh, we don't have time, but otherwise there are some great examples of resourcefulness uh, in India where, uh, you know, education was delivered to public, public address system on a television because people didn't have uh, you know, devices. Yeah, but that's another thing. So let's quickly move on. And I think we have uh, the last question, uh, you know, which is addressed to all of you. If you can just want to share some um, info, some uh, thoughts on what could be uh, one or two big challenges that, uh, you know, universities could face in the transformation journey. So, so anybody 
Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah. Uh, that'll set the stage for Matt, actually. I think the biggest change is changing our mental models of education, you know, what it means, how it's delivered, uh, uh, and all of those things. The, the technology can follow along, but the way we conceive of, of, of how we, what education is for and how it's delivered and who gets it and where, how do they apply it, that needs some work because otherwise, if you just automate an existing process that doesn't work very, very well, you just get more garbage at a higher rate. So, Matt, I'm sure you have thoughts on this. Yeah. I, I, I think we live in a very incumbent world. People are very comfortable with where they are. So the, the transformation that they know isn't, isn't big. It's just a small trajectory of where they are. They're tethered to what they know. Think about the way that universities and colleges are designed. They're designed when we didn't have technology. We didn't have the advances of what we have today. Yet, we are still tethered to a lot of the same things that we've done when I was running a registrar's office where I didn't have much computers, right? We still operate in that model. So when we ask for schools, and, and I'm, I, I push the envelope with my clients. The clients that I work with, they're willing to push the envelope. Clients that don't want to push the envelope, I don't normally work with because we're not going to get very far with them. They're going to continue to be in that gray level. I call it the gray uh, level of, of transformation where they're just putting a new system in or putting a new LMS in. But if you ask them what they do, they're doing what they did in 1990s still. What I'm looking at is this trajectory of how do I reimagine what a campus does? That requires people that have vision, that requires people who have a forefront thinking of how to go about it. And they have to believe that what they're doing for the future is more important for what they are doing today. That is the biggest transformational challenge we have. It's not the technology. I could put in any technology you want, but I can't put technology if you're not willing to leverage the technology. It would be like us using Amazon as a technology and Kmart saying, no, you still have to do what Kmart does or what Walmart does in the 1990s. No, you have to reimagine how Amazon operates. So that's why you see Target operating that way. That's why you see uh, um, Walmart operating that way. They are operating knowing there is a transformation. And I think universities will start to transform when the mega schools and the community colleges and, and I think when, when employers remove the, remove the degree criteria, listen to what I just said, when employers remove the degree criteria, higher ed will transform because they won't be focused on a 120 hour pathway anymore. They will be then focused on meeting the industry's needs during that time. When employers remove that degree barrier, you will see the transformation that really should happen and you will see higher ed transform as fast as possible because that every school that then focuses on what they're learning becomes the key element of transformation. Absolutely, Matt, thank you for sharing that. We're just running out of time. So Priyanka, any quick uh, challenges you wanna share? Before? I think we'll ask the, the biggest roadblock we have already discussed, that's the mindset. I think if we, if we can change that, I think uh, technology is already there. It's growing and uh, it, 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 it will, you know, make a change. But then the mindset is something if we can, uh, if we can change that, I think the higher education space will be, will be at some other level. So I think mindset is the major roadblock that I've been experiencing, uh -huh. not just education. I think that's a, that's a digital transformation roadblock in every space, not just education. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Priyanka, for that. Okay, so with that, uh, we just want to quickly summarize to DX or not to DX, I don't think is a question. Yes, hybrid model needs to be based on clear objectives, you to kind of bring in best of both the worlds. And uh, technology is available, yeah, and uh, you know, universities can choose what they want. Good retentions, outcomes obviously need to be the focus in addition to or other defined objectives. There will always be challenges, but if you're focused on your objectives, I think solutions are available on technology. So uh, gentlemen and uh, ladies, it has been wonderful uh, discussing with this panel. I would like to hand over to Harsha to take on question answers. We already short, overshot the time, but I think another five minutes should be fine. So over to you, Harsha. Thank you so much, Ulas. Uh, 
uh, just a quick check. I hope uh, panelists, uh, it's okay if we extend by five minutes. Yeah, it's fine. Good. So there are a couple of questions, but before that, uh, if I uh, before I talk about Harbinder Group, uh, would like to come in. Amazing thought process uh, that you have put across the table. Solid points. Looks like we are already transforming. Looking at the different perspectives that I have from different industries, starting from educator to the companies that are actually transforming the workforce education. Uh, looks pretty amazing. Thank you so much, panelists. With that, uh, I'll just quickly talk about uh, a minute on Harbinger Group. So Harbinger Group is a global provider of uh, software product and services established in the year 1990. So it's been 30 years we are into the business and serving our clients across the <coughs> globe, uh, right from North America, Europe, uh, UK, Middle East. With, with the uh, organization headcount uh, somewhere across 850 to uh, plus odd employees in India and abroad, and having the uh, offshore uh, operations also in USA and India. Now, uh, with that, uh, the uh, at the company level, uh, the company is divided into three groups, uh, which is Harbinger Systems, where we talk about end-to-end -end product engineering services for HR tech, ed tech, and health tech. Then we have Harbinger Knowledge Products, where we have interaction-ready uh, products for the learning and development professionals. To name a few, Raptivity, which is a rapid interactivity tool, which is a DIY tool. Then we have Quillians, which is an uh, amazing AI assessment tool to create your uh, quizzes uh, at just four steps. Uh, then we have Harbinger Interactive Learning, which is the uh, custom learning wing of uh, Harbinger Group that talks about the digital transformation of content, custom uh, modernization, and the new learning modalities that uh, companies, higher ed, and skilling segments are looking for. With that, uh, it's time for we open up for the question and answers. We do have two questions. So looking at the time, I'll quickly take up uh, a one uh, question from that. And then uh, we can mail the questions uh, to you to understand what are your point of views to share it with the audience. So this is a question from Josh uh, that uh, says the learning objective comes from the industry. Department chairs are responsible for making sure that the LO align with the uh, learning objectives align with the industry demands are then shared with professors who are responsible for aligning the learning objectives with the course content. Not all professors understand how to inject these LO to the learning materials. Uh, do you have any point of views on that? How actually the professors are enabling the learning objectives and providing the learning materials to the students? If any one of you can yeah, take up, yeah, I, I, I'll take that because that's something I deal with. This is cor this is correct. The the, the outcomes that um, industry is looking for need to be part of this, but there are two pieces. One is there's more. The, one of the stakeholders in this is not specific employers or industry in general, but society itself. So that also has to be taken into account, but just assuming that there's a set of outcomes, those of you who worked in, uh, have worked in an industry know that there's a set of market requirements, you know, market requirements document. And then there's a product specification, which is the answer to the market requires, requirements document. So if you think of that model, then the requirements that come from industry and other parties what needs to be done in order to satisfy those requirements becomes the learning outcomes, which are supposed to be incorporated into a curriculum, not a single course, but into the entire curriculum. And we in the faculty try to do that. It's a hard process. It, it, it's not easy to do. Uh, and sometimes, you know, the, the constraints are, is, are how many credit hours do we have available and how much do we have to cover? And then what is the level to which we are covering those things? So yeah, we understand this concept. It's, it's part of the accreditation uh, uh, process for programs as well as institutions, but it's not easy. And sometimes when people are too specialized, even within a particular department, they teach certain courses and they don't teach other courses, that fragmentation is hurtful to this process of ensuring that the outcomes are appropriately defined and attained by the students. So very good point. Uh, it is already done to some extent, maybe not as well as it could be done, but it, uh, it, it's something that we need to keep working at. Thank you so much, Amit. There is one more question that I would like to pick, uh, which is, 
digital transformation requires skills not only the technology knowledge but also knowledge of business models sustainability and social impact how can we include all these elements into the learning for current and future leaders sorry i'll jump in here and then any sorry yeah matt Priyanka, if you can yeah if you can yeah, jump in this is a very important point and it goes to the, the fact that you know technology by itself learning technical skills is not enough you need to have other skills as well and then the 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 driver behind this is we really need to teach learning how to learn okay because if students are able to know how to do that they can keep up with what's going on and, yeah, and that... I, I'll sorry one, one, one last comment I'll support that because if you look at the salaries earned by people graduating from the humanities and those from stem uh, stem uh, disciplines in the beginning the gap is wide over a 30 year period the gap pretty much vanishes right so it, it's again that notion of learning how to learn uh, that becomes an, uh, important yeah you know my my daughter is a freshman well now she's a sophomore now at Baylor when she was first going to college, she asked me what major, you know, because I'm in higher ed, she's like, what major should I become dad? And I said, I don't really care what major you are, because I think what you're really going to need to do is learn how to learn, learn how to uh, absorb information, process information, because I said to her, the jobs of the future, the job that you may take on may not exist today. So if you start to learn a skill and that's what you learn, that may be outdated by the time you get to your career path. What I said to her was learn how to learn, learn how to, to reimagine and rethink your learning. So you need to be social, you need to have the ability to be sustainable in your learning path. You know, I believe universities and college should be a lifelong learning model. Right now we're a four year model and that's why we look at enrollment numbers. If universities and colleges would focus on a lifelong learning model where they're providing competency-based education for people to continuously transform with the understanding of the future of work and the future of learning. You know, we talk about how learning outcomes are important. Well, learning outcome of today and learning outcome of five years from now are gonna be different, but you need to continuously use technology and advancements to modernize your software, modernize the, the, the frameworks that you put your content in, because content is the, the key. A university's key asset is the knowledge that you disseminate. That knowledge comes from faculty, that comes from research. You have to focus on those things and enable it with technology. And that's why I say to my daughter, I don't really care what major you are. I mean, she's an entrepreneurship and a, and a marketing major now, but, but that's because that I told her to find something that she loves, that she'll wake up every morning, that she enjoys people in the classroom, that she'll have challenges in, in the projects that they give her and make that your major. Whatever that you call it a title, it doesn't matter because your experience of that will make you the leader that you move forward. Matt, I just have to say that uh, you're a very fortunate father, or if you've done an excellent <laughs> job of parenting, that your kids ask you for your opinions. <laughs> so Absolutely, I was about to say the same. Thank you so much, Ahmed, Priyanka, Olas. Uh, with uh, <clears throat> Matt, with that, I'll just go uh, and conclude the session, today's session. Uh, so, uh, yes. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ulas, and to all the panelists for being an amazing uh, show. And I would like to thank to all the viewers who have joined us from Zoom as well as LinkedIn. With that, if anyone of uh, the in the audiences and people who have joined us late want to know and understand more about the uh, topic we discussed today, or in general, if you have any queries, you can drop us a line on uh, this email ID. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, panelists. Thanks, Harsha. Bye-bye.